Bengal Club virtual event. And it's not only the first Bengal Club virtual event, as far as we know, it is the first of its kind in the city as well. And also the topic that Professor Rudramsha Mukherjee is going to talk about today, which is the sacking of a teacher from the annals of early Kolkata. He has not spoken about this before. Uh, so that is a first as well. Uh, Professor Mukherjee does not really need an introduction, uh, particularly to a Bengal club audience. He is, of course, one of the preeminent historians of the country. Uh, he is now serving as Chancellor and Professor of History at Ashoka University. And as many of you will know, he is an excellent raconteur as well. I rather suspect that he will mix both his gifts to great advantage. Uh, the format of this talk is pretty much similar to the physical talks, it, with one difference. Uh, the audience will remain muted during the course of the talk because a lot of background noise and technical glitches tend to get in the way of these things. So you will remain muted for the duration of the talk. Uh, at the end of the talk, during the Q&A session, I will invite you to uh, <coughs> write your questions in the chat box that you will find towards uh, the bottom of your screen, uh, but that can wait uh, till the chat session. So over to you, uh, Rudram Shwa. Good evening. Uh, coincidentally, it is Pochisha Boshak, Rabindranath's birthday. So as a good Bengali, I'll begin with Rabindranath. In, in his novel, Joga Jog, uh, which roughly translates into English as affinities or connections, uh, whatever you want to make of it, uh, he writes in the very beginning, I think if memory serves me right, the second sentence goes something like this, Arambhero Arambho Ache, Shonde Balar Pradip Jalar Age, Shokal Balar Sholte Pakano, which translated means that before the lighting of the evening lamp, there is the preparation in the morning of the wicks of the lamps. So before I light the lamp of this evening's talk, I would like to prepare the wick a little bit. And that takes me to back to 1816 at a meeting that was held in a person's house who was in 1816, not that well known in the city of Cal, growing city of Calcutta, but within a few years, he would become very, very famous. His name was Ra Ramohan Roy. In 1816, he called a meeting uh, in his house of like-minded people, friends, the purpose of that meeting was to discuss or to discuss the effects of idol worship and how idol worship could gradually be undermined. In that meeting was present a very good friend of Ramon, who actually hadn't been invited to the meeting, but he came nonetheless. He was a Scotsman. His name was David Hare who had come to Calcutta at Calcutta at the age of 25 in 1800, settled here, set up a free school, which by the way still exists, Hare School, most of you know the name. And he was a watchmaker, but he was very familiar with, in, with Indians of Calcutta. He went to their houses and so on and so forth. So he, that's how he became a friend of Ram Mohan Roy. He was present at that meeting and having participated in that meeting, Hare made the very important point. He said, you cannot actually bring down the influence of idol worship, let alone eradicate it, unless you improve the standard and the level of education in Bengal, Calcutta or Indian society. And he said that all of you, the great and the good who are gathered here should actually get together to set up an educational institution of a very high caliber. Everybody said that it was a very good idea, but Hare found that nobody actually took this idea forward. So Hare took his idea 
to the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a man called Edward Hyde East. Hyde East heard hair out and he also thought it was a very good idea and he did some inquiries of his own to find out if actually the people of Calcutta, the notables of the, of the city of Calcutta were at all interested in this project, whether they would put money into this project, would send their sons to this educational institution and his due diligence produced a very positive response and he called two meetings. He called one meeting and that was followed by another meeting. This now we are at May 1816 where he discussed with uh, a number of very important people in Calcutta which included uh, some very, very familiar names. Radha Kanto Dev, the scion of the Dev, Shobhabhaja Dev family, uh, Ram Kamal Sen, uh, who was known as Devan Ram Kamal Sen, who, whose grandson is even more famous, Keshav Sen, Roshomoy Dutt of the Rambagan Dutt family, who's, from which family came R.C. Dutt, Toru Dutt, the poet, R.C. Dutt, the famous bureaucrat and historian, and so on. People like that were all present. And there in the second meeting, it was decided that uh, an, indeed an educational institution would be set up with the cooperation of the government of the day and these very worthies of the city of Calcutta. The governor would be its patron and the money would actually be provided by, the government would facilitate the process, but the money would be put out by the rich, the wealthy of Calcutta. And there would be a governing body to this college which would have eight Europeans and 12 Indians. A corpus was built up money was promised and then people gave money. The total corpus, it might sound surprising today, was that was collected with this effort was rupees 1,13,000. And the two most notable highest benefactors were the Raja Badwan, Tejchad Bahadur and Gopi Mohan Dev. There were others who contributed as well. So this is how the educational institution known as Hindu College started in 20th January 18th, on 20th January 1817. It first started in three, one after the other, three residential houses of some wealthy people in North Calcutta and Chitpur. And then in 1825, it moved to College Street to a land that had been actually be given by David Hare. It was David Hare's land to the north of College Square, where today Sanskrit College stands. So Hindu College and Sanskrit College for a pretty long time shared the premises, where Presidency College, the later incarnation of Hindu College stands, is, was a later development. The time we are talking about, Hindu College was actually where today Sanskrit College stands. Now, the other point to note here is in the rules and regulations on what the college was about that was laid out, the first set of rules and regulations that were set out, and it is said that Hare had a hand in drafting this, it was put down that the college was meant to be for the education of the sons of respectable Hindus. And this college would impart tuition, education, in the English and Indian languages and literature and the sciences of the West and of Asia. So both in terms of funding and both in terms of its aims and purposes and for its clientele, the kinds of students, it was a college by the Hindus for the Hindus. Hence its name, Hindu College, was entirely justified. In fact, the name of the college suggested who had set it up and for what purpose it had been set, set up. Now this college did not, in its initial periods, have a very smooth run. By 1825, the treasurer of the college, Joseph Barreto, the firm of Joseph Barreto, went bankrupt and it failed and it went bankrupt and the college was in dire financial straits. It had only rupees 65,000 left out of that corpus. So 
it went through another round of fundraising and that's how it managed to keep afloat the date is rather important because in the protagonist of our story enters the history of hindu college in 1826 when he was only 17 years old a little older than some of most of his students his name was henry henry louis vivian de Rosier. he was just 17 years old uh, he joined as the fourth teacher at a salary of rupees 150 per month now it's a mystery how he got that job because he had very little educational qualifications we know that up to the age of 14 he went to a school in dharmatala which was known as the dharmatala academy or often referred to as the drummond academy because the founder of that school was a man called an englishman called drummond he was a prodigious and a precocious student in that school uh, wrote poetry wrote plays wrote essays and he was a um, reader of all sorts of things but he could only stay in that school uh, till the age of 14 when he joined a firm of accountants called James Scott where his father worked he worked in that accounting firm for a little more than a year and then he moved to Bhagalpur where he worked in an indigo factory came back to Calcutta in 1826 joined the India Gazette as a sub editor and then finally in 1820 same year he got this job in Hindu college. So he had no, he had no what we today would call a curriculum vitae, as it were, to present to the authorities of Hindu college. He had just had been a student of the age of 14. Uh, and he was given that job. We don't know how, uh, because he was also not, we don't know how is important because he was not well connected at this point in Calcutta because he came from a rather underprivileged background, so underprivileged that he had to actually earn a living. He had to earn a living from the age of 14. And also we know that where he lived, where Derosio's house was, was actually technically outside the precincts of the city of Calcutta. It was to the east of what is today Lower Circular Road, what was, what was then also Lower Circular Road. And that is to say, it was beyond what was called the Maratha Ditch. So it was not actually in the city of Calcutta. And secondly, uh, he was not white. His, grandfa great, his grandfather was described, is still described in the baptism records of St. John's where he was baptized as a native Protestant. So Derosio was an East, what was then called an East Indian. He was probably of Anglo-Portuguese origin, but there was somewhere Indian blood in him. He was certainly not, he certainly did not belong to the white elite white population of Calcutta. The location of his house suggests that. He didn't live in Park Street or south of Park Street uh, you know, in the roads that went off Park Street, where most of the elite white population lived. And if he had lived any longer, there is no doubt that he would never have been able to enter the portals of Bengal Club at that point of time. So, uh, so it's a mystery how he got that job. Uh, maybe somebody was very impressed by his prodigious and precocious learning, and that's what got him the job. Within a very short time, within a year and a year and a half, Derosio became a sensation as a teacher. Absolute sensation. He was by far the most popular teacher. He was by far the most influential teacher in college. And he, his teaching became a legend in the city. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? How did this young man, 17 years old, as I said, barely, a little older than the boys he was teaching, what did he do? What did he teach? 
what made him such a great teacher. One of his students has left behind an account of what Derosio tried to imbibe in his students. And he says that he did five things which this student considered uh, were very important. One, he said, it was the sacred duty, quote unquote. It was the sacred duty of students to think for themselves. They should have a mind of their own and they should use that mind. Second, Derosio emphasized the free exchange of ideas. And he said that students should also be free to express themselves, whatever they were thinking about, whether without any kind of restrictions. Third, he said that students should read outside the set curriculum. And Derosio often used to read aloud to the students from books that were not part of the syllabus, prescribed syllabus. Fourth, he said, students should stand up for truth and virtue. And fifth, he encouraged students to come and meet him outside the classroom and even outside the college. No doubt, this, these interactions were possible because they were roughly, the students and the teacher were roughly of the same age group. So this is what he tried to do. And I should add that having had the good fortune to be taught by some of the most outstanding teachers uh, in Presidency College, in the other institutions that I've had the good fortune to study, Dirosio was doing nothing more than what every good teacher tries to do with his or her students. He was trying to open up the minds of students. There's a great anecdote that a sixth form form master of Eton, when he first met the sixth form, he used to say, all right, guys, all right, chaps, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to cram you for a first or do you want me to open up the mind? Derosio's he wanted to open up the minds of his students. Now, this had an impact given the circumstances, given what he, Calcutta society was like at that point of time, it had an immediate impact on the students. So we now need to turn from Derosio to who were these students? These students were sons of very wealthy people of Calcutta, upper caste and wealthy, all from established Hindu families. In their family, in their families or in their homes, they were enveloped by tradition, ritual, deference and orthodoxies of various kinds. Orthodoxies that were often dictated by very ignorant Brahmin pundits. Students of this kind felt the impact of this precocious teacher that they encountered in Hindu college. And they began to look around themselves and question the world in which they lived. And some of them came up with remarkable answers, uh, sometimes outrageous actions. One such very funny incident was one of Derosio's favorite pupils, Ram Gopal Ghosh, who was later to become famous as the Demosthenes of Calcutta. He was such a good orator. Ram Gopal Ghosh came from a very wealthy family and there was a family deity, the goddess Kali. And Ram Gopal Ghosh's father noticed day in, day out, that when Ram Gopal Ghosh left for Hindu college, he did not pay his usual respects to the family deity. So he called his son and said, I've noticed this, what's going on? You should pay your respect to the goddess Kali when you leave the house. So Ram Gopal Ghosh didn't defy his father. He said, of course I will. And when he fast passed the family temple, he raised his hat and said, good morning, ma'am. So, but more importantly and more seriously, what the students began to question 
where orthodoxies, particularly caste restrictions, dietary taboos, they began to eat among themselves, cutting across caste barriers. They began to taste forbidden meat, beef and pork. And some of them even said, why shouldn't we drink alcohol? What is wrong with it? So these kinds of things were happening. And who were the most alarmed? The Orthodox parents. They saw their familiar traditional values of the family were being disrupted by their sons who were going to this college. So they raised an alarm. They raised an alarm. And the first to articulate this alarm to the college authorities was none other than Radhakanta Dev of Shobha Bajar. Radhakanta Dev wrote a letter, July 1830, to H.H. H. Wilson, who was the chairman of the governing body of Hindu College, to say that he was getting reports uh, from the college that students were becoming highly disorderly. They were carrying out activities that were completely unacceptable in Hindu society. They were inconsistent with the laws and usages of upper caste Hindus. And uh, they were uh, eating the kind of food that only Mohammedans and Christians ate. And he went a step further. He said, I've got reports that students of Hindu college are guilty of fornication and sodomy. So, and he said that offend, the offending students should immediately be expelled from the college. And the teachers who were encouraging such activities, such modes of behavior should also be sacked. He said, unless this is done, we will be forced to withdraw our boys from the college, and we will also tell our relatives to withdraw their boys from the college. So he also reminded Wilson very strongly that he shouldn't forget, as somebody who was administering the college, that the college had been set up by the Hindus for the Hindus. So, He wrote a letter two days later to Wilson again. He said, I'm delighted to find that you have taken some of the steps that I have told you. You, have, you are ensuring that castes do not intermingle and so on and so forth. I want you to uh, carry on this activity and see to it, he said, that students do not share their food and do not share their tiffin rooms. And he said, I have requested Ram, our, our friend and colleague, Ram Kamal Sen was also a member of the governing body of, the, of Hindu college. He said, I have uh, uh, requested Ram Kamal Sen to ensure, to go to the college, to ensure that these are actually being put in place and no violations of these norms are taking place. He asked Ram Komal Sen to do this because it was easy for Ram Komal Sen to do that because Ram Komal Sen lived across from Hindu college. I mean, the very big building that stands today opposite Presidency College where the College Street Coffee House is located was the house of Ram Komal Sen. That's where Ram Komal Sen lived. Sorry about this passing trivia about the history of Calcutta. And that's where Keshav Sen actually grew up. It's in that house that Keshav Sen grew up. So Hindu college was across the street from where Dam Ram Kamal Sen lived. And so Ram Kamal Sen could easily walk across and see what was going on in this college. What is significant here is the name of Dirozio, or for that matter, any teacher hasn't still been mentioned by either by Radha Konto Dev. It hasn't come up for in any kind of correspondence. So Dirozio went happily went on teaching. In 1831, things took a more serious turn, probably because 
parents or fathers began to actually withdraw their students from Hindu college. And Ram Kamal Sen now raised the matter at the governing body formally. And he said that at the root of this evil was this teacher called Dirozio. And unless Dirozio was removed, Hindu college had no future. And that discussion took place and it was decided that Dirozio would be dismissed. But Hare and Wilson, the two white members of the governing body said that he should not be removed because he is a very competent teacher and a very good teacher. And another Indian member, Joy Krishna Sinha, Joy Krishna Singh, as they said those days, also said, Dirozio is an outstanding teacher. He should not be removed from the college. But when it came to the vote in the governing body, David Hare and H.H. H. Wilson, by the way, H.H. H. Wilson would later become the first Bowden professor of Sanskrit in the University of Oxford. He was a very eminent linguist. H.H. H. Wilson and David Hare refused to vote. They abstained because they said this was a matter that affected only the native managers, quote unquote, the native managers of the college. So whatever they decided, that would be fine. And Jai Kishan Singh voted in favor of retaining Tirosio. So uh, it was actually three, if you take the abstentions and Jai Kishan Singh, it was three versus three. So it wasn't even a majority decision, two persons abstained. Dirozio heard that the decision had been taken to dismiss him. So he resigned. April 25th, 1831. And he wrote a letter, a separate letter to H.H. H. Wilson with, went with the formal resignation letter, where he said that, uh, I cannot conceal from myself the fact, I'm quoting, I cannot conceal from myself the fact that my resignation is compulsory, that he had been forced to resign. Hence my title, sacking of a teacher. To say that De, De Rosio resigned of his own will be a complete travesty of facts. Now, he went on to say, and I'm sorry, I'm going to read this out because I think it's a very, very important statement that De Rosio made post his resignation. He resigned and then with the resignation letter, he sent, sent this letter. He wrote to Wilson. Firstly, no charge was brought against me. Second, if any accusation was brought forward, I was not informed of it. Third, I was not called up to face my accusers if any such appeared. Fourthly, no witness was examined on either side. Fifthly, my conduct and character underwent scrutiny and no opportunity was afforded me of defending either. Sixthly, while a majority did not, as I have learned, considered me an unfit person to be connected with the college, it was resolved, notwithstanding, that I should be removed from it, so that, and mark the words here, so that unbiased, unexamined, and unheard, you resolve to dismiss me without even the mockery of a trial, so that unbiased, unexamined and unheard, you resolve to dismiss me without even the mockery of a trial." Unquote. Thus, in April 1831, Dirozio left the portals of Hindu college to die of cholera at the end of the year 
in utter penury. Thus left one of the most outstanding teachers of Hindu college and its later incarnation, Presidency College. The college has had many, many fine teachers, but I don't think there's been anybody like De Rosio in the history of teaching at Hindu College or Presidency. Now, what remains still a mystery is that what were actually the charges against De Rosio? We will come back to that in a moment. But before that, there is another significant point to know. Be, be, because De Rosio was a rather, because De Rosio was a poet, and he was in, eight, in the 18, late 1820s, he was considered a very good poet in uh, the literary circles, the small literary circle of Calcutta, English lit poetry circle of Calcutta. And uh, he, he was rather well connected with some important ladies and gentlemen who also wrote poetry and were for part of this eminent, part of this poetry circle. None of them spoke in favor of De Rosio or protested against De Rosio's removal. Neither did Hare and Wilson ever write anything in favor of De Rosio in their subsequent careers. Even posthumously, they did not praise De Rosio. So De Rosio, except for a handful of students, very loyal students who came to be called young Bengal, actually left this world unsung, unmourned, and without any protest at all. To come back to the point about what were the charges against him. Perhaps Tiroz went unsung. This is a point that cannot be completely ignored because of his social position. The fact that he was an East Indian who was not acceptable to the white elite. Neither was he accepted, of course, among the Indian Bengali population, who most of whom were upper caste Hindus. So he was caught in between. So that also says something about the racial dimensions of Calcutta's social life in the 1820s, early 1830s. So to come back to the charges, in a personal letter, Wilson wrote immediately after De Rosio's resignation, he posed three very pointed questions to De Rosio. And these questions are an indication of what that managing committee of the college, college might have discussed. I mean, these were, might have been some of the issues that came up for discussion or where charges that were level, leveled against De Rosio. The three questions that Wilson asked were, do you believe in God? Two, do you think respect and obedience to parents is no part of moral duty? Three, do you think the intermarriage of brothers and sisters is innocent and allowable? So going backwards, he was being charged with promoting incest. He was being charged with promoting disrespect towards elders parents particularly. And thirdly, he was being charged with atheism. So De Rosio actually gave a longish reply to these charges. The longest part of it was the answer he gave to the first question. The second and the third questions she dismissed very easily. He said, I've never taught disrespect to my disrespect for parents to my students. In fact, you can ask, he named two persons. He said, Mohan Singh and Dokkinaranjan Mukherjee, who had problems with their fathers, you can ask them, and you will find that I advise them actually to go and make it up with their father and to apologize to their father for their bad behavior. And he said, the idea that I promoted incest is a complete absurdity. So he turned then to the question of atheism. And his reply, in his reply, he said that 
in the hearing of any human being, I have never denied the existence of God. Now mark that as the quote, in the presence of any human being, I have never denied, or he said in the hearing, actually not present, in the hearing of any human being, I have never denied the existence of God. So is that a direct answer to a direct question? Unfortunately not. Uh, he might have been an atheist, but he had never proclaimed it publicly either in private or in public. So he, all that he's saying, in public, I have never denied the existence of God. He is not making a statement about his denial of God or acceptance of God. But what he went on to say that behind this question is a bigger question. I can see that. That is, what did I teach my students? Did I teach my students atheism? Did I teach my students to be free thinking? And he said, yes. I introduced them to the ideas of David Hume. And I introduced them to the ideas of skepticism. That unless you have evidence that Hume said, unless you have evidence for the existence of God, you cannot accept the existence of God. But he said, I just didn't do that. I gave them a count, I gave them counter arguments for against Hume. Philosophers who had argued against Hume, men of the cloth who had argues, argued against Hume's skepticism to speak about the existence of God. He said, I told my I introduced my students to skepticism and to ideas of belief. I felt as, my, as a teacher, that's my duty to give my students both sides of the argument. So he said, if the charge against me is that I unhinged the religious belief of some students, then I should also be given credit that I reinforced the religious beliefs of some students because I gave them both sides of the argument. And then he went on to spell out that what he had tried to do as a teacher in that letter to Wilson. He said, and I'm reading from, again, entrusted as I was for some time with the education of youth peculiarly circumstanced, mark that word, peculiarly circumstanced, was it for me to have made them pert and ignorant dogmatists? Setting aside the narrowness of mind which such a course might have evinced, it would have been injurious to the mental energies and acquirements of the young men themselves. Deleuze was self-consciously an enlightenment figure. He has fashioned himself along the lines of 18th century enlightenment philosophy. He was an admirer, he was an admirer of Kant. He translated Kant, in fact. He was going back further in time. He was an admirer of Bacon. He frequently quoted Bacon. He was an admirer of the poetry of Shelley. So he brought to his teaching these ideas of the enlightenment and he wanted to open up the minds of his students by informing them, by educating them into these, what were in Europe at that time, the most advanced ideas. He thought that was his duty as a teacher in Calcutta in the late 1820s, early 1830s. But this aim ran completely counter to those who had established Hindu college. Radha Kanto Dev, Ram Kamal Sen, Roshamoy Dat, people like these were not opposed to Western learning. Let's be clear about this. They might have been conservatives, but they were not opposed to Western learning. But Western learning to them was purely transactional. 
they wanted their sons to be educated in Western learning so that they would get jobs in the lower rungs of the British administration. So learning, Western learning as an avenue for employment. De Rosio's attitude to education was exactly the opposite. He wanted to open up the minds of students. He wanted to genuinely educate them. He took that word education from its original Latin root, educare, to go forth, to stand forth. So he wanted to take students forward in their thinking, to make them think for themselves. It was this contradictory pulls contradictory attitudes towards education that led to his dismissal from, and I insist on the word dismissal, from Hindu college. Now you might very well ask why I have narrated this story uh, to you. There are five points why I thought it was important to narrate this story to this audience. One was, of course, obvious. I wanted to recall the life of an extraordinary individual, the tragic and the meteoric life of an extraordinary individual. Calcutta has seldom seen uh, an individual like uh, Henry Louis Vivian de Rosio. Second, this episode in the very early history of Calcutta uh, gives us an idea about what in what kind of society Hindu college was located and where in that society Western education was first introduced. That society, as we have seen, was Hindu and upper caste dominated. And that society had racial overtones, it had caste overtones, it had racial overtones on both sides of the racial divide, white as well as native or Indian. And when it came to transgressions of its orthodoxies, in spite of having introduced liberal education and attempting to introduce liberal values, it could actually be very illiberal. And finally, that two different approaches to education with which I ended. Education as an avenue to a career, education as an avenue to knowledge. I don't think this opposition has left us even today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudram Shudha. Very, very enlightening talk. Um, <clears throat> Rudram Shudha will answer some questions and answers now. But um, unlike in uh, physical events, you can't ask them because your mics are muted. However, you can ask them through the chat box. If you look at the panel at the bottom of your screen, there are a couple of buttons in the middle and the second is the chat box. So if you uh, type your questions there, I am just now sending out your uh, uh, comment saying that you can ask questions here, then I will read out some of those questions to Rudran So uh, please uh, type in uh, any questions that you might have in the chat box. Uh, I have received, all right, uh, one uh, question from Mr. Kakkar, Mr. Pradeep Kakkar, Rudram Shuddha. Why didn't Heron Wilson take a tougher stand? Uh, 
Pradeep, it's difficult why Wilson didn't take a tougher stand. I don't think, I think Wilson didn't want as the chairman of the governing body to disrupt. He saw this as a government come private venture, the private, private part being completely Hindu and Indian. He didn't want to disrupt in any way that partnership that the college had. So he just uh, abstained instead of taking on a more confrontationist line. That's, that would be my explanation. And uh, I dare say from the little that I know, or I have later come to know about Wilson, even when he was in, in Oxford as a board and professor, he was not by character a person who preferred confrontation. Uh, another question from Anirban. Do you think the resignation of Vidya Shakur 20 years later was some sort of repetition of history, both becoming disturbing for the administration in general? No, so uh, it's a very good question. Uh, Vidya Shakur res resigned because he came into direct <coughs> conflict with the government of Bengal. Uh, let me just tell you the background. Uh, Halliday, who had been the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal in the early 1860s, asked Bidda Shagur or gave oral permission to Bidda Shagur to set up free girls' schools in the district towns of Bengal. Bidda Shagur had already started the process because he had set up, set up a free girls' school in Birshingo in his own village. And Halliday, when he got to hear about this, he said, why are you just doing it in your own village? Why don't you do it in the district towns of Bengal? That will have a greater impact and the government will support, in, support you for it and will provide fund, which Halliday provided. Then Halliday's term was over and Halliday went away. Halliday was a personal friend and an admirer of Bidda Shagur. And Bidashagor, when Bidashagor, after Halliday's departure, he Bidashagor went to the government to ask for the renewal of the funds. The D then DPI, I don't recall his name, forgive me, said, So where is the piece of paper on which you are asking for these funds? So Bidashagor said, I only have the word of uh, Halliday, and we never actually went into any kind of formal agreement. There's no letter that I can carry, uh, that I have with me. And this bureaucrat said, sorry, uh, if you don't have a formal order, you, I can't give you any money, so you should close down all the schools. So Bidda Shagor, in protest, resigned from every single government position that he held. He was not just the principal of uh, Sanskrit College. He was the inspector of colleges. He was a teacher in Fort William College, very senior teacher in Fort William College. He resigned on every single post and never worked with the government again. So that's the background uh, to Bidda Shago's resignation. Two very important resignations from in the educational sphere in the 19th century, but the situations are a little different. Amazing how can you can recall all these details from the drop of a hat. Uh, <clears throat> question from Monojit. Is the De Rosio, in the De Rosio drama, is there any evidence of what Brahmo leaders of the time may have thought or expressed? Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, I'll repeat. Uh, in the De Rosio drama, is there any evidence of what the Brahmo leaders of the time may have thought or expressed. Okay, so the Brahmo Shomaj is established in 1828, two years after uh, Dirozio joins uh, Hindu college. Ramon leaves uh, for England in 1831. Now, whoever was left, in the Brahmo Samaj, the most important presence being Darakanath Thakur, 
uh, Rabindranath's grandfather and a great friend, younger friend of Ramon Roy. We have no evidence that either Darukanath Thakur or anybody from the Brahmo Shaman made any kind of protest or any kind of statement uh, regarding what had happened to Dirozio. Um, okay, another uh, question from Bonani, uh, the Bonani Kakkar. What made Dirozio the person that he was? What influenced him? You have addressed, you have touched upon this, but maybe a little more uh, detail. Well, Tirozio was what today we would call an autodidact. He, he just was a voracious reader and he read. And as I said, the influences on him were the ideals of the Enlightenment. He read the Enlightenment writers and Enlightenment philosophers, particularly Bacon and Kant he read, and the poetry of Shelley. So these were the major, and he was aware of some of the scientists of the 16th and the 17th centuries as well. So that's how he saw himself as a man who uh, respected questioning, respected an open mind. These were the influences that worked on him as far as we know. He wrote very little, particularly about himself. He wrote very little, the output Particularly, his prose output is minimal. He wrote a lot of poetry, but uh, and that poetry is available now in a volume that uh, a member of this club has put together. Rosinka Choudhury has put together Derozio's poet, uh, poems and his writings uh, with a very very good introduction. So those who are interested in Derozio can go back to this volume. It's called Derozio, uh, the definitive, the writings of Derozio, the definitive edition or something like this, published by Oxford University Press. Um, another question from Shushmita Mitter. Uh, Keshav Chandra Sen's father had agreed at the first meeting to steer Bengalis away from orthodoxy. So why did he take the role of getting Derozio dismissed? I don't think it's Keshav Chandra Sen's father. Keshav Chandra Sen's father died when Keshav Chandra Sen was six years old. Uh, Ram Kamal Sen, if that's who you are referring to, is the grandfather of Keshav Chandra Sen. And uh, he didn't want to steer people away from orthodoxy at all. Ram Kamal Sen was in fact one of the bastions of orthodoxy in Calcutta, very much so. Uh, another question from By the, way, the father of Keshav Chandra Sen is Pyari Chandra Sen, not Ram Kamal Sen. Ram Kamal Sen is the grandfather. Uh, another question from Mudumita Shah. Interested to know more on the racial paradigm of the administrative body on Hindu College. Is that documented? Well, it's not documented in the sense that. Uh, the government had representation in it. This is important for what happened subsequently to Hindu College, to which I'll come a little later. Uh, the government, when uh, that move was made to give Hindu College a separate house north of College Square, the land that David Hare gave, uh, the college, the government also provided 25 lakhs of rupees to the college. So there was a government representation and that representation was of obviously all white. <clears throat> People like Wilson, Hare and others and so on and so forth. Hyde East in the beginning of the college, they were all white people. And then they were on the other side, uh, the, the Bengali worthies or the non non-European worthies of Calcutta. So this is the great racial divide in the governing body. And as we, as we saw that at a critical juncture, when critical decisions had to be taken, the white sections of the governing body often just remained silent or abstained and allowed the native managers of the college to take the decision. So, this allows me to tell you what happened to Hindu College. For the second time around in its short career, Hindu College went into 
near bankruptcy at the end of 1853 and 1854. And in the beginning of 1854, it had actually to be shut down. The native managers of the college could no longer finance the college. So it had to shut down, completely shut down. And it was revived completely at the government's initiative as a government institution in 1855. So for about one year or a little less than one year, there was no existence of Hindu college till after 11 months, it re-emerges as presidency college. Now, this is no longer a government come private initiative. It is completely a government initiative. It is no longer just a Hindu college. It is open to everybody. Anybody can join it. And this is a decision that the government, i.e. the white section of Calcutta society actually takes to set up to reinvent Hindu college as presidency college. So, even though I made the statement that it, is, it was open to everybody, it was not till the late 1870s, I think 1878, that the first Muslim was admitted to Presidency College. And, um, and as a passing trivia, since I'm passing on a lot of trivia, there is a school on College Street opposite Presidency College, which is still called Hindu school. Okay. We forget and to forget this. It is still called Hindu school. And the first Muslim student in Hindu school was admitted when I was a student of Presidency College. And that year is 1971. I am combining uh, questions that a lot of members have asked, which are more or less along the same line. Uh, how do you see De Rosio, the De Rosio incident in today's India. What is the contemporary resonance is what a lot of members have asked. So I ended, ended with one contemporary resonance, which is very important, I think. What is education about? Is it about getting jobs, building a career, or is it about the pursuit of knowledge? Okay. Uh, the most... Uh, important institution in Bengal of higher education, the University of Calcutta has as its motto, advancement of learning. Does it advance learning? I re leave the question with you, or is it just an assembly line for producing graduates? Okay, that's one. I think the second point is even more important in contemporary India the ability to think for oneself, the ability to think for yourself, ability to ask questions, the ability to express oneself freely and to stand up for one, what one believes in. I think these are things that De Rosio has left behind and it's not just De Rosio, many other very eminent people have also emphasized these points. I mean, Bidashagur, for example, I mean, nothing could cow him down. Nobody could bully Bidashagur into doing something or believing something that he actually strongly believed in. He believed that Hindu widows should be allowed to remarry, and he did it at considerable risk to himself. I mean, this is not often remembered that there was a time when after, the, after 1855, when the Hindu Widow Remarriage Act was passed, Bidashagur was had to walk the streets of Calcutta with bodyguards on the right and the left of him. Because conservatives of Calcutta, men like Radha Kanto Dev, who abused Bidashagur, threatened to have him beaten up and have him killed. But that didn't stop Bidashagur. I think this is what which starts with De Rosio, or is one of the starting points in De Rosio, also with Ramon Roy, who is a con senior contemporary, but they worked in Calcutta around the same time. And I didn't have time to say this. When Hyde East and David Hare were having those initial meetings, the worthies of Calcutta who were present at those meetings said, we will be very happy to put up this 
college that is being discussed. But if Ramon Roy is part of this project, we have nothing to do with this project because Ramon Roy does not believe in Hindu orthodoxy. He has emerged in Calcutta as the strongest critic of Hindu orthodoxy. And when Hare carried this message to Ramon Roy, Ramon actually said, don't worry. I will not be, since this is the objection, I will not be part of this project, but this project is too important. I will not put my ego before this project. Go ahead with this project. I don't want to be associated with this project if my association stops the project. So he stood apart. He distanced himself from this project. So again, the fact that he knew what he stood for, he wasn't willing to compromise what he stood for. De Rosio did the same and other people in what we call the Bengal Renaissance, we tend to forget this. Michael Madhusudan Dutt, for example, he, he was outlawed from his own family because of what he believed. So there were people like that who stood and I think that's the contemporary resonance. I sometimes feel that we haven't yet caught up with our 19th century past. On that note, the final question from Dipankar Mitra, which is sort of, you sort of already touched on it. Uh, he says, uh, it seems that the postulation of David Hare that education will change the attitude towards idol worship uh, doesn't work even now. So you would probably agree. I, I'd agree with that. But then again, the question is, have we really advanced education in the sense that what true education should be about? That's the question I want to leave you with. Are we really advancing education as Dirozio wanted it, as Bidashagor wanted it? Uh, one member has commented lightly, uh, Professor Arun Kumar Dashgupta's comment on the English uh, postgrads. He famously said that one of the purposes was to gain a good match. Sorry? Was to gain a good marital match. <laughs> I think uh, that's uh, all the questions uh, for tonight. Um, I would now like to invite Professor Choitali Mitra of the Library Committee to deliver the vote of thanks, please. Is Professor Mitra allowed, uh, able to uh, make herself heard? Um, I don't think so. I think she might be having technical issues. Anyway, thank you very, very much. Lots of members have uh, expressed uh, a great deal of uh, admiration and gratitude for holding this uh, talk during these very difficult times. So thanks everybody for attending. Thanks to the Bengal Club staff who have worked uh, behind the scenes to make this possible. And thanks, of course, uh, to Rudram Shuda, who has uh, given us uh, one more uh, enlightening talk uh, was very uh, was very fascinating and uh, throws lights uh, on uh, lots of different things thank you very much good night